right. uh, unless it pays off, right? But, and you can never predict that part of it. However, you know, for me, you can literally bid on yield on a partial every day of the week and count on it because again, defaults the seller kicks back in. Yeah, yeah. When you're buying these performing assets that are performing for two, three, four years, let's flip it over. Does not performing ever trickle in the head? Like it's been performing for three, four years. I'm going to sell his asset at a great 12 yield, but in a non-performing world, that may be a really low return because of certain situations. Right. Do you even care about that? A strong pay history definitely helps. That that makes me feel a lot more warm and fuzzy. Uh, and it makes, makes me much more comfortable. Um, but there's always that possibility. And I'm, economy, you know, who knows, who knows what's going to happen down the road. And I, I just, I can't a hundred percent say that just because they've made payments the last 24 months, they're going to continue to make payments for the next 28 years. Uh, I, I just, there's no guarantee there. So it's always in the back of my mind. It's always something that I have to at least factor for. Yeah. And I have to agree with you. Um, I bid everything unless the partial based on a non-performing cap layer that includes performing. Yeah. Um, and again, those we'll have on next, uh, on December 30th, two of the, the classmates that took our last class, um, explain some of what was going through their heads before they took the class and how they, what their mindset changed. So please definitely tune in for it. We have uh, Candace and David on in two weeks because you can bid everything as a performing asset because they're performing before, but you never know what's gonna happen in the future. Um, right. You can't guarantee you're gonna have a 20 year note for 12% a year and nothing happens to it. Right. Um, so when you flip over the non-performing world, it's a lot of differences in opinions. You and I differ in our opinions as, as much as anyone else would. Yeah. But why, it, besides the fact that if a loan is performing and it can not perform, why is calculating a non-performing asset important and saying, screw it's foreclosure. I don't got to worry about anything. What other factors you, do you agree with that come into play when it goes not performing? Why is non-performing asset a concern? That's always a concern. So, I mean, I was having a discussion with somebody just the other day and we we're talking about uh, just locally here, uh, there was a development that was going up and about 10 years ago and, and out of the blue for no reason that anybody knows of, and I'm, there's obviously reasons, but for whatever reason, the developer stopped, whether they ran out of money or ran into some other kind of trouble or something. Uh, and so development just stopped. So you've got a bunch of houses that are either completed or partially completed that are now just sitting vacant. Uh, a vacant property deteriorates surprisingly quickly. Uh, I, and it's, it makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever that I, I, just because it's empty shouldn't make that much difference, but it does. It makes a huge difference. All of a sudden, things start breaking where it's, yeah. you know, people had lived there for five years and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden it's been vacant a year and all kinds of things start happening, whether it's just natural or from vandalism. Um, so that's, that's always a concern. That's always something that I'm thinking of and, you know, how long has it been empty and how long could it be empty until something happens? And it's always a concern. So we're always looking at that possibility. Yeah, I agree with you. I think also come to play is that each state is different, yeah. right? Um, the house deteriorates, but each state, you can't guarantee that Texas is going to be like Ohio, which would be like Florida, which would right. be like New Jersey, like California. But each state has a different way to it, right? right. Um, an asset that may work in Texas, the pricing may not work in New Jersey right. because of taxes, property taxes, uh, foreclosure laws. Um, and you have to price it accordingly because of that problem. And if you yeah. bid your Texas assets like you do an Ohio asset, right. you can run into a lot of problems. Cost and time frame adds up because you have more expenses in a state that takes longer. Property taxes, uh, servicing fees, um, forced place insurance, and more time for that property to kind of get beat up. Um, yeah. No. And a classic example of that is, is let's, let's take Ohio and Texas. So Ohio, for whatever reason, has very high taxes. You can be in, in yep. Cleveland or Columbus or somewhere, and the taxes are, uh, for the same value property, 
the taxes will be a double or triple uh, in Ohio versus Texas. So if you've got even six months worth of non-payment and you're responsible for those taxes, that can make an enormous difference uh, between those two states. Uh, for, you know, everything else being equal, yeah. uh, that can make a huge difference to your numbers. Yeah, and I know some people use a flat foreclosure cost thing, and for the most part, that can be somewhat accurate. Um, mm -hmm. And you can dive into deeper once you get into due diligence yeah. um, on things, but you need to make sure you calculate the foreclosure costs and right. time frames. Um, you also have to include things like the servicing fee because if it goes not performing, you're not foreclosing the next day, right? That right. comes into play that it would not happens. Um, and I think most people forget that because they don't, they just say, listen, I'm foreclosed. It's all good. I have enough money set aside. And especially if you're buying assets that are less than 50,000, mm -hmm. that foreclosure cost, and if you're in Ohio, that property tax will eat yeah. up a lot of your profit quickly before you even foreclose on it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Three, 4,000 a year can eat up a lot. Plus your six, 7,000 for your foreclosure fee. You're looking at easily 10 grand in foreclosing with the, with the property tax packed onto it. Right. And heaven forbid the taxes get sold to a tax lien buyer. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they've jacked on 18% interest and yeah. it gets, it gets very expensive very quickly. Yeah, this is all stuff that we cover in our class, and we had yeah. a great discussion on this and and went over it in detail. If you don't calculate this stuff, oh yeah, you need to learn it. And it, and I get it. We talked for a while about giving out our calculator, but what we found out is that most people don't understand it, and they really need to understand how to build their own and yes. how to maneuver their own. Um, yeah. And Candace and Dave will talk about how they started developing their own calculator so they can calculate their own thing and figure out things on their own. Um, in our class talks, we spend two weeks developing the calculator that you're going to use. Um, so that is extremely important. In part of that non-performing calculator, you can include a performing feature that if it continues to perform, it's okay, right? right. And if that is your hurdle because of the 3% loan, then that will trigger it and say, okay, this is I have to bid this much to make sure it makes sense for me. Um, but you got to also include reason we ask for like what's next due date is that there's also a situation where even a non-performing asset can flip to performing right and if you are in a spot where you're just bidding on non-performing bids expecting to get the property you're in a rude awakening because it can reinstate at any moment for whatever reason and go performing and if that's a three percent two percent coupon interest rate right you can be in a really bad spot quickly when they put a bunch of money down, you yeah. can't mod the deal and you move forward with the idea that you're going to get the property and in turn, you start getting payments, which you think is great. However, if you bid this thing way too low or too high, you're not going to get the return you're targeting, even at performing. You know, yeah. I made the mistake years ago. Yeah. So reinstatement happens. Yeah. And, and sometimes that's exactly what you want. And sometimes that's your worst nightmare yes. and, it, and it's the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. Uh, so, and again, you have to be prepared for all of these different possibilities. Uh, and that's part of that is building out your calculator to say, so if this happens, if that happens, if this happens, if that happens and, and yeah. to the best of our ability, yeah. uh, trying to work that out and see what could happen. Yeah. And, and that's the key. So many, Things. We don't know what's going to happen. And right. we've heard people say, well, you know, I've been taught that you can go into a deal knowing what the bar is probably going to do. That's wonderful, but that's as far as you can take it, right? Yeah. Don't count on the borrower to do what you think it's going to do because you don't know the borrower situation 100%. Yeah. Don't. And, and people don't always do the logical, rational no. thing. This is a uh, house. This is their home. Oh, Yeah we've both seen that several yeah. times over where this to, if they did this, that's the most logical, that's makes the most sense, but for whatever reason they do that. And yeah, absolutely. So um, I do see the fact that we have a question from Alan uh, regarding uh, can property tax be added to legal collectible balance of a property that goes with foreclosure. And yes, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Pretty much anything you add as a collectible balance, it could be insurance, it could be whatever. And also read over your, your note, make sure what can be cannot be added. 
independent state laws, um, things like your foreclosure costs, your attorney costs. Certain states like Ohio, you can't add that to it. Right. 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 Um, some states you can. Um, it, some states you can add it to your, um, you know, your reinstatement, but you can't add it to your collectible. Right. Um, so those are the kind of things that come into play. Now, do you have to be pristine and everything? No. But you have to know the fact that you can't add certain things on all the time. Um, yeah. And things like Ohio, which is the only state, I don't understand why they do this, is this 66% of yeah. a pre a, appraisal value at foreclosure, which means that any moment that appraisal value, when you go to foreclosure in any other state, you set the bid based on whatever you want to. Ohio has this law in place that says if I think it's three people go out, they appraise the property and you 66% of what they think the property's worth is the bid. So if you want to bid lower, you can't. You can bid higher, but you can't bid lower. 